Well, I can. Oh, I just wanted to prepare the cake. You eat it faster. Okay, cool. Um, hello, camera. Hello, Hitler. Um, well, as I said before, <laughs> uh, I have no title, so obviously no title. Um, go, sit. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, so, well, again, still, that's, again, still me. So, uh, yeah, as I said before, I do a lot of sports when I'm at least in Vienna. And two things I like a lot, that's volleyball. So that's why I have a volleyball. If anyone wants to play with me, I'm always happy to play outside. It's pretty warm now. Uh, and trampoline jumping. So when I jump, it looks kind of like this. <laughs> it's my professional jumping. So this is when I jump. It's most of the time it looks like this. And yeah. From <laughs> <laughs> time to time. <laughs> Pardon? It's good that you are using underwear. Yeah, <laughs> not always. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, okay. So. Oops. Yeah. Okay, let's start. Um, as you probably know, um, I'm from this little country over there, the European Union, and I'm from the center. So um, I'm from a little town called Reichenstein. Um, we have a town, sorry, it's a, it's a village with about 100 people, so very small. Um, and as you see, it's nearly on the other side of the world. Um, yes, and the little town, this is the house where I live normally, when I'm not uh, in Vienna, where I studied the last five years. And now I'm going to tell you a bit um, what I did before I studied, and then it's about some projects during my uh, during the university in Vienna and in uh, Denmark. Um, I studied before I went to university. We have something, it's called HTL, uh, we call it HTL. It's, I think, similar to the Polytech here. So you can start it with 15 to 19. So you are in a special school and um, what we learned is, or what I did is, uh, we've, I focused on, on software engineering and hardware building. So we started with understanding electronics, build their own chips and so, so we started to um, create chips then from assembler up to yeah, C and Java and so. Um, with this knowledge, at, like at the end or in the middle of the, of the school, we started to combine it with, uh, with motors, so create some robots and so. So it was like the first time where I got into this human robot or in the robot field. Um, and at the end, you get something called a university entrance degree. So you're allowed to go to university. Um, benefits are you are done with like 19. You have kind of a bachelor, I would say, but without the um, uh, project management part. So at least in university, we have project management as a big part. That's uh, something we haven't had in the, uh, before. Um, but the negative parts are that I have, for example, nearly no knowledge about history and geography. Um, and normally you learn at least three languages in Austria. But in this case, um, instead of a new language, we, I studied um, informatics. So that was the negative and benefit part. Yes, I can talk binary. <laughs> um, yeah, so robots, so there were some robot challenges. Um, so we tried to give them some power and let them walk. It was quite nice competitions they had in Austria uh, and, and in Vienna, or no, sorry, in Steyr. Um, yeah, so that was like the first part of how I got into this field. Um, in the middle of my, uh, of the school, I was like 17. I started with my brother, a small company. Um, what we did is it was a location, a uh, local advertising page, but um, that's now nine years ago. So at the beginning, what nearly everyone had, you had these pages where you had like a long list of companies there. Um, because at this time, when you, when you go, to, when you go to, a, to any town, you wanted to know where are companies, where, are, um, where, where you have like places, interesting places where you could go. But no one had a smartphone at this time. So you had um, very often in the centers, you had like a terminals and we had a partner company who were creating terminals and you had them in Austria and different cities. 
And you could go there if you're a tourist and say, okay, what's up here? What can I do? Where can I find something? Um, you can look up in this um, list. Um, after a while, Google came with uh, Google Maps and Google Map API. And we ported everything on the API, uh, yeah, on Google Maps. So it was the first big change in the company. Um, it was quite interesting. But as you know, smartphone revolution came. And our partners, they were specialized in the um, in terminals, so it's quite hard to say, hey guys, we have to change the whole system you just built up will fail in the next two years. They said, no, no, for sure not. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> it did. So, but I was still in school, so, and at the end of my, of the previous school, uh, before I started with university, I thought, what should I do? And I was actually more interested in, in university to expand my knowledge about computer science a bit more, so we kind of faded it out. It was very interesting experiments, um, but I thought, I don't know, university is more interesting than companies because it, it starts to get a bit boring. If you always do the same, you walk around, new customers, and I'm actually more an engineer. Um, so, yeah. Well, then, move to Vienna. Oh, and by the way, I think all the pictures you see are made by me. Uh, is, Christoph, could you close the windows a bit? Oh, there. Curtain, sorry. I think it's a bit hard to see. Well, a bit. I don't know. Normally, we have. We've seen enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it good? I know. Okay, good. Well, as I said, I started as a bachelor, a uh, bachelor in, in Vienna, and computer science, as you know. And at the end, um, I had to do, of course, my bachelor thesis. And it was the first time I got in contact with. Um, computer science and psychology. And what I did is, you may know the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's kind of an old um, way to describe what people need, but it's still, it still kind of fits. So you have, on the one hand, uh, psychological parts. Of course, you need to have a place to, to sleep and so on. And if you and go up to, uh, like, um, to be spontaneous to do whatever you want. So if you look back in history, obviously you had like people who were just working and then going home. And now we are here in university and we, every one of us wants to do whatever we want. And so this is kind of the needs and that's the best. What I did, I compared, I looked at systems and GPS tools actually at this time and, and apps, um, which combined those two parts. So of course it's simple to find something like um, now Airbnb, so where can I sleep or things like this, or we'll find us something to eat. Um, but on higher levels, we have, most of us, I guess, have like Facebook or so on their phones. So you can be spontaneous. You see maybe, ah, this person is just a friend of mine, is just in town. I can spontaneously do something. So it was kind of the first time, as I said, to com combine like computer science, the technologies we have with psychology, how can they kind of help us or are they in the similar levels. Um, we also had to do a bachelor project, and this is, I think quite interesting. Um, well, most interesting, sorry, but <laughs> uh, it's a project that I'm still working on somehow, and it was called Tech Prize. We had a problem, we still have a problem, I think, that um, there is no service where we can find um, all the groceries out there, what's the, where, where I can find them, what is, uh, how much costs a Coke or whatever, and where I can find them, how much was it in the past. So uh, what we wanted, we wanted to have more transparency. Because at the moment you have these huge companies and they kind of dictate the market. And you, as you see in, in the media and hardware market, that you have some pages where you can see, okay, I can buy this product at this uh, company. And um, it, it kind of created in the last like 10 or seven years a quite a big competition between different companies even small companies. And here we have a problem that um, products are getting more and more expensive, but we cannot really do anything, we cannot really see it. What we wanted, so what we did is, we used um, from OpenStreetMap the, the shops we already have, and we created a tool where you have on the other side, you can add uh, products. So actually a product database on itself would be interesting. Because Google had something like this, but they closed it next week. So, uh, and there is nothing um, open. There's not like 
Wikipedia, nothing open, everything is, if you have a database, then it's coming from a company. There's nothing free made from us. And what we wanted, you have those two parts, and there's something perfect, the perfect table, that's the receipt. And every receipt, you have on top, of course, the location, and you have the price and the product. So you can use the database of, of products, the database of, of places from OpenStreetMap, and combine them. And from now on, you see where in the world you can buy products, how, how expensive they are, and can compare it. You can, you can even see if it works well. You can even see if companies work together, do something like against the law, and say, OK, we changed the, the price, and you do it too. And you see it immediately in the statistics. Um, so this is kind of what we wanted to do, but it was a bit too ambitious. And we asked some uh, companies, uh, venture angels, but they, this is an NGO model. So it's not created in a way that we want to make money. It's from people for people. Um, so it was not really the time where I said, ah, that's great, because we had no business model in this case. Um, but I'm still working on, I'm interested in a simple app where I just make a picture, it analyzes it, and it tells me then, OK, what shop it is it, is it, and the price and the product. Because at the end, it should be you make a picture, you can just left back and save, make a picture, and then uh, it's more or less done. So everyone knows from now on what was the price. And for yourself, you have a perfect, um, you know exactly what you bought in the last weeks or months. It's probably also interesting for yourself if you want. Well, then move to uh, Copenhagen for a while, for like half a year, a bit more. Um, and I studied there a bit cluster algorithms and um, academic English. <laughs> it was one of the most important parts I went there to learn English. Uh, cluster algorithms are quite interesting if you can kind of simulate um, a folding of um, proteins or how to, um, to kind of fight against the brain cancer. So it's really interesting if you can do it like fast with, with a lot of computers instead of like wait a week or weeks for one computer and how to scale it in the right way. Uh, it was quite cool. Um, afterwards, I went back to Vienna. I worked as an Android and HTML5 developer. Um, this app is um, it's kind of a price comparison page. So what, is, what it does is it, um, you can see the prices of gas stations around. And you can change it all the time. It was quite a big uh, app. So I think it still is. Like we had downloads more than like 100,000. So it was all the, the apps, some of the apps we created were like the uh, top one in, in the App Store. And the other thing, I know that's a horrible newspaper, sorry. Uh, Alex, <laughs> worst newspaper in Austria, I guess. Um, but what, <laughs> pardon? Uh, no, not for them. We created, um, I created an HTML5 or um, e-paper e reader. And they used our uh, reader. So yeah, it's one of the companies who used our readers. But this is at least they say under uh, this company says they are the biggest newspaper in Austria. So it's also quite cool. Uh, it was interesting. So as I learned HTML5 and H uh, and Android at this time a bit. Well, then back to Vienna and to my masters. And now I talk a bit about some projects um, during the. Hmm? <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the. Building on the side. <laughs> this is not the university. On the side. <laughs> well, but if you, st yeah, and then this, yeah, behind it. So. <laughs> well, you have more. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if I have the other building. Well, <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> we, um, yeah, um, what I did there is, in this case, uh, we concentrated, or I concentrated more on human-centered design and on design thinking. So we did a lot of um, understanding of humans, ethnographic studies. And so one kind of interesting project we did is it, we called it sharing fetal movements. So um, I had a friend. She was from, or she is from Stockholm. And she did a PhD in Stockholm. But for one year, she was in, in Austria in Vienna, and, but her husband was still in Stock Stockholm. So, and, well, she was pregnant. The thing is, 
I guess when people and, and a couple is pregnant, they want to like share this with each other. I don't know, touch the, the, the stomach. Oh, okay, cool, oh, it moved. Um, I think, I don't know, but, but it seems like this is, was important for her. But so you want to share kind of feelings. So we created something to share actually feeling at the end. Um, what we did, it's a wearable device. We used um, Arduino lily pads. It's like small um, Arduinos, which you can wash. So that's pretty cool um, and program. And so we created a belt where we measured when the baby was like boxing. And the father had the same, but with vibro sensors. So um, when the baby was boxing, he could feel it. Ah! And the coolest thing is that it was like, I mean, it's, it's, it's technically interesting, but the, more int the really interesting part is um, that the person on the other side, the father, you create, you create emotions on the other side. It's like, so it, it's not important if it's accurate or not, but you sit there and you're chop away and then ah, oh, my baby just did something. You know, this, this really interesting how you can use um, technology to create this, this feeling in other people. Um, yeah, so that looked, that's me, so that's, I'm not the father. <laughs> I'm not the father, seriously. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> yeah, so you know, that's how it looks inside. Um, prototyping, rapid prototyping is really interesting and works really fast and easy with um, Arduino lily pads. So everyone can use it if you ever want, or I don't know if no one, someone of us, of you doesn't know it. Um, we cannot make anything wrong, that's a good part. Yes, they had, we had inside also vibrators, um, so he could feel it like, okay, he was boxing here, here, here. Um, and we also had, on the outside, we have had LEDs, because in this case, some people don't want someone that touches them all the time, especially like, you know, you're in the office and it's like, oh, can I touch? And it's oh, not again. Or so. But if you have this, like, lights going on, doo -doo, and then people say, oh, how cool, it moves. So, yeah, it also creates this kind of, I don't know, nice feeling thingy. Yeah. Something else I did, also wearable device, um, uh, with the same person and with a team of five people or so. Um, it was called motivating team um, team training armband. So what you have you have this this wearable device, this band uh, armband on your hand, and it's created for teams. So you we created a system where you had at the beginning you have a a team of let's say five people and every one of us I want to run for example uh, two kilometers this week everyone creates its own goal at the beginning of the week that creates a goal for the whole group and now everyone has to fulfill its goal um, otherwise the group doesn't fulfill its own group goal um, and when you see someone else for example have doing sport or running, then you also saw it on your armband, so it was notifying, notifying you. Um, it was also created, especially often you are not in the same, same town, same city, uh, you have different times where you start and stop working, so you do sport alone, but you still want to be kind of in a group. Um, and at the end, what we created is you, you could, you, for example, your team and then another team, and you fight against this other team virtually. But of course, this makes the, the kind of group pressure. So you have to do your duties. Otherwise, the group will lose eventually. Um, yeah, so the band was always um, informing you how much you have to do and what the group did in the past um, or this week. Um, yeah, so a bit of prototyping. So this is how prototyping in our case work. And it's really cool. Um, well, really cool, but um, if you use um, What's this called in English? It's plasticine. No, it's plasticine. Yeah, plasticine. So if you use plasticine, and it can immediately see, okay, this is what we want. This is how long it has to be. How heavy it is. It's really simple to get the first feeling for wearable devices. Um, yeah, and this was then the next um, part. So this is how it looked, kind of how it looked at the end. And we also had an app um, which was always connected with the group and was informing you and told you, okay, hey. Um, it's the end of the week, you should do something. So what if you walk home instead of use the bike uh, or use the car or, or metros or so? Good. Now my um, master project and master thesis was about gamification of rehabilitation. Um, 
show you. OK. One problem in if you lose an arm in this case is that it takes at least six to eight weeks till you can start with rehabilitation, to can start to use the first kind of prosthesis, and like a half a year or sometimes longer to use an actual uh, mu um, sensor and prosthesis. So the this one, the the white one, is extreme advanced uh, prosthesis where you can kind of move everything, but it's the the uh, the rehabilitation itself is quite hard. It takes a long time, and we wanted to make this part shorter. So um, what happens is if you ask engineers, um, is that you get a virtual reality tool where you are where you have like a mu sensor here and you are in the virtual reality with your head up display, uh, head mounted display and you walk around and you can uh, practice. So um, this is how it looked at the beginning and you maybe noticed this video um, because Peter who was here some months ago, he worked on the same in the same group and they made this system. So you have, have you seen, you have the new sensor and this is how it looks inside. So this is what the participant sees. It's a black world <laughs> with these balls and you can touch them. Da, da, da. Yeah, so this is when you ask engineers to do something like this, <laughs> computer scientists, they come up with, yes, it works, it's faster, it's a black world, and it's exactly doing what you want. But the problem is rehabilitation is first of all um, quite boring. And yeah, second of all, not really funny. Um, so one problem engineers, or at least they didn't look at, is that if you just lost your arm, it's one of the most significant moments in your life. That's nothing simple. It's not like, mm, just see, I'll give me a new arm. It's something where you're probably in the depression, where you have, you have to work on this. So um, we thought, couldn't we change something? So we wanted to create a game. Uh, at least in my case, I created kind of a prototype. So how could it look like? Uh, I talked with quite a lot of psychologists um, and people who work in this field, um, what we can do. And um, you may know Jane McGonagall. It's a quite in, uh, famous um, um, game designer. She said, as you probably can read, uh, a game is an opportunity to focus our energy with relentless optimism at something we're good at or getting better at and enjoy. In other words, gameplay is the direct uh, emotional opposite of depression. So this is where we wanted to go. We want to find something um, against uh, that people helps not to fall into depression. So I created a prototype where you have like four parts. At the beginning, we thought people are angry, just lost something, they want to just get rid of it. So um, it's kind of destroy something, but um, I have to say that this approach doesn't work for everyone. Many people don't want this destroyed because they just came from something like an accident or so. But for, for some people it works. So we created like for one, it's like in more an idea um, and we should be able to adjust it sooner or later. So, um, but what you are at the beginning, you are a giant because the world shouldn't be frightening, shouldn't be frightening for you. So you're bigger than the world, nothing can harm you. Um, but you're kind of angry. So uh, you are a giant um, tree which lost its arms and or its branches and you collect it during the, the game kind of and then you get your power back. Uh, and so this world at the beginning looked like this. So that's the game I created or like a prototype. So you are uh, this giant and there is one of your arms. You can go down and, and find and collect the arm. <laughs> like, this should be, you, you're big, you go down and you get it actually. Um, so, oh, yeah, so wait a second. I can show you how it looks like. Yes. Because, this, because at the moment we are trying to everything. Um, <laughs> so the good part, if you if you gamify if you have this gamification, is that normally um, you concentrate on your lost arm. So you're always okay. You're in this boring world, and, you're, oh, and you hate it because you you always get get you know you always see this arm. But 
Christoph, here is your cake. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so can be quite boring. And, and so what I wanted to do is create something like the Mu sensor should be a game controller. And while you play computer games, normally after a while you don't see the controller. Uh, but you get better and better and better all the time because the game itself gives you more challenges. So you, you have to use more buttons at the same time. And that's kind of what we wanted with the sensor. So you use, um, you, you don't really realize that you use the sensor and it's getting more and more complex what you do. Um, so yeah, the game always reflected the state, the inner states. Um, so at the top of the mountain, you could then see, okay, this is where I go. Like this is the happy place when I'm, when everything works, but still I have to work quite a lot. So yeah, you work through this world. At the beginning, you're angry, then you get your arm. You could create some, uh, you, at the middle, you could like suck up um, uh, water and could um, help the trees. So, because they are burning. So you started to use your hand again and to help someone because at the beginning, when you lose your arm, you need help from all the people around you. But after all, at the end, you want to help people. You want to get back on your normal stage where you have been before. Um, yeah, so that's why the third part is, we call it create life. You can use your water now. You have to have dead trees and you can water it and then they start to get more and more beautiful. Um, yes, and at the end you have a beautiful world. Everything works. You have at the end a complex arm. You can really do complex things with your hand. Um, so this is like the idea to teach people at the same time um, to reflect on their inner state and help them with their psychological problems at the moment. Uh, yeah, so that was my master project. And two days before I came here, I had my, um, my defense and then came over here, started on human-robot interaction. Um, now I'm here and some, um, yeah, the, I work in a, in a joint project with the ENSILP, that's the linguistic department uh, here, the linguistic department in Chicago, Northwestern University in the HIT lab. So um, that means I already in the project, I have to work with robots, with group of robots and with language. The first part uh, I looked at, or at the moment do some experiments with robots is I want to look at peer pressure and conformity. You can also turn it around a bit and can say it's um, like social proof. So very often, if you learn a language, you are surrounded with people who are speaking the language. Um, so this is one quite, uh, quite natural way to, um, to, to learn the language. Um, so I looked at this part, or I still do. And then after, at the end, um, my thesis topic or will be uh, about language teaching with robots. So is it possible? Uh, what's the best ways? So the things we can do, we cannot do. Um, yeah, so short introduction, what means conformity? Here is a short video, quite funny one. I don't know if you saw it, but. The gentleman in the, the, elevator. Gentleman in the elevator now is a candidate. Star. Is a candidate These, star. Folks, were These folks were entering. The man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently, and subsequently one, other member, one other member of our staff will face the rear. Will face the rear. And you'll see, and you'll see how this man, how this man in the trench coat, <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, he looks at his watch but he's making really an making an excuse for turning just a little, just bit, more. A little bit more. The now we we'll try it once now again. We'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here's the candid Here subject. comes the candid Here comes the candid stand. camera stand. Three of them at least. Three of them at least. And uh, and this uh, man this man has apparently been, has apparently been in groups before. Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a first he makes a full turn to the rear, and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, a moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. Now 
to see if we can use. I want to see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie Siegel, everybody turns forward. Dirty, notice they take off they take off their hats. Do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. Yeah, so this gives you uh, a bit of, um, shows you what conformity and group pressure means. Um, we think we are pretty individual, we can do whatever we want, but actually we are, we are social creatures and we love to be like the others. We kind of want to be, we, we feel uh, we have to do it. Um, so, and yeah, so my study is about um, peer pressure. And there is a famous experiment, the same person made, it's called the Esch experiment. So what is it about? You had, um, you ask people um, to, to answer, you have here three lines, and on the, on the right side, um, you, they have to say what is the matching line. So it's A, B, and C. In this case, it's clearly C. Um, and what you do in the experiment, what they did, they have confederates, um, and so you need at least three or four confederates and one person who is the real uh, participant, and the confederates are, will say the wrong thing. So in this case, they will say A. And um, the question was, will, will this one participant follow them? Um, and what Ash found out is that if you have three or four, let's say at least four people, you're gonna see, you will see that if you have four people, they create enough peer pressure that a person will do the wrong thing eventually. Um, even though they know exactly it's wrong, but they think maybe it's really me, I'm the wrong person, because how could it be that the rest of the group says the same thing? Um, so that's the last slide and last video, short one. Um, so I sh just told you how it looks like, and this is the actual video, um, how, what? Up next, Brian. up next, what Brian. Will do? What will Brian. he do? One, one. The first few times the, the first few times the plants pick the obviously incorrect Brian line, confidently Brian confidently defies the group. Confidently defies the group. One, one, three. Three. Confident because confident just because card. just look at the of card. Course the only of course, logical the only answer logical is answer is three. And this card. And this nobody card. Could possibly nobody could possibly anything, say anything, but three is the correct, is the correct here answer well. here as right? well. Right? Just watch. Okay. Just watch. Two. Two. Notice Brian's, Notice eyes, start Brian's eyes start to and droop. Listen to his and listen to his voice get softer. Three. When the group gets, it, when the wrong group gets it wrong again. And again. And again. Three. 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 Two. For Two. four rounds Two. now, he's been fighting the good fight against conformity. Three. 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 But with the pressure mounting. Three. 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 He just can't fight. He just anymore. can't fight anymore. And in succeeding and rounds, in succeeding with, Brian rounds with Brian continuing to give answers, he knows to be wrong. Two. 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 He only gets sadder. He only gets sadder. And softer and softer. Three. By the final trial. By the final trial. He's a thoroughly, he's beaten, a thoroughly man. beaten man. One. One. I gave up. I gave up. One. There were times when I didn't. There were times when I didn't even look at the uh, lines and said the answer. I became quiet. I became decided, quiet. Decided I that wasn't playing the game. I right, wasn't playing so the game right, so I just I just played along. Played along. Yeah. So this is conformity when we we obviously know the right answer and we know that that must be true, but the rest is doing something wrong. And as you probably imagine, that all those studies came. Uh, started after the Second World War. So how was it possible that the Nazis, that everyone is doing this? Um, this is one of the reasons, because we are, uh, we conform with the group, especially if you have more than three or four people. And if you imagine you have like thousands of people standing in Vienna and always, ah, shouting, whatever, um, then you are with you, with them. What we want to find out now is, can robots do the same? Because it can, be used for good parts, so I want to use it kind of for language, for teaching, but it can also be used for bad parts. If company or governments want to change the way of words, for example, we change global warming to climate change, it has a different connotation um, and can change the way how we vote. Um, so this is what we want to find out. So it's already a bit late and everyone is hungry, so yeah, thanks. <laughs>
took longer than I thought, sorry. So after your experiment, do you have any results with that one or, or any conclusion about what happened? Um, we are still working on the experiment. So um, at the moment we ran only the robot, parts of the robot, um, but we have to change, we still have to change something. So we ran actually the trials at the beginning, at the moment. Um, and the real experiment with way more people will start in the next some weeks, actually. Um, but well, we can already see that the robots are influencing. Uh, they are. They are, um, especially if it's about um, ambiguous situations. So if it's not, if if it's quite close, then people follow most of the time with the robot. If it's at least in, in the trial we we had before, or we ran. Uh, in the other situations, at the moment it's lower. So we are like at 18 percent instead of uh, 33 or 35 percent. So. Yeah, compared with the humans. Pardon? The number of robots. Um, four. With four robots and here. No, no. Does the number of robots matter in terms of how heavy the pressure is on individuals? This is what we haven't tested. So this is, uh, we have to do it during the bigger study. So this is like testing, okay, let's test it with the same situation Ash had, like four humans, one, uh, well, four confederates, one participant, and we, um, Replace the confederates with robots. To the graph that he showed was before, uh, after four human, after four people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very stable, just yeah. So it's forward. this is changing a lot, and then yeah, not I, that I, much. I know, but that, that is with people. Yes. I, what, yes. I'm, what I'm wondering is two things. One, um, does it matter if I have, if I'm the government and I'm trying to change a perception of, I don't know, NSA spying. Does it matter if I have a machine or if I have machines that are pushing a certain um, thing on the um, front of the other public? And the other thing I'm wondering is whether or not um, the critical number where you have that leveling up and st stabilizing is different for um, people versus robots. Okay. Yeah. In other That's words, if they're seen as the same type of social agent mm -hmm. that a person is, or they have the same weight in terms of how they influence um, conformity beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is, I think that if you try to test with different number of robots, you need a lot of participants and it's super expensive. Anyway, so probably the best way to start that yeah. is to start with the critical numbers that in this case. Yeah, at the test. moment we, we want to compare it directly. Yeah. Um, and then we change the number of robots, hopefully, in the future. Um, especially, well, one, we, we also see it with humans, so I guess there won't be a big difference. Uh, at least you don't trust the robot at all, because it's just, you think it's a robot, not just four or five robots. The same with humans, if you have just one, you normally don't follow, because it's just the person is wrong, I'm right. If a group is right, it's different, because we are, we live in groups normally, so uh, we follow the groups. Well, it depends so much uh, people participating in this kind of social situation. You have, for example, hierarchy, something that influences the, the opinion of the other people. Hierarchy? Yeah, I mean that uh, the, the social level of the different hierarchy. participants. Hierarchy. hierarchy. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Hierarchy. So, yes. as you boss or you mm -hmm. mom, or some yeah. authority yeah. figure is telling you something. Yeah, so those studies Ash made, and that's why. Um, um, well, they are quite interesting. Those studies are made with, with people um, they don't know. So especially the, con uh, the, the participant doesn't know anyone. It's, and we know that if you use, for example, your friends or even people who study the same, you follow more. Um, because you have the similarity effect. So if you want to change something and you be as similar as possible to the other person, this person will follow you. The, the probability is way higher that this person follows you than if you're completely different. And so the age and the gender of the people get some influence. I mean, for example, people tend to follow more old, old people rather than... Um, we couldn't really see. Also, um, yeah. they couldn't that's, see differences. That's likely to vary with, that's very likely to vary with culture. Um, yes, culture is the biggest um, change. But Milgram's experiment, Milgram's experiment right. which was inspired by the same thing, yeah. showed that um, trappings of authority, the white coat, mm -hmm. um, make a huge difference as well. Yes. I don't know if you want to incorporate that in any way. No. Now we ex 
included from. So what we, what we really try is we have um, the, the presentation, so we use projectors, um, and in, I sit just in another room, and the robot's like, oh, what, and then just click on the next. I'm not, I'm not standing in front of them, and so like with the white coats, like, hey, this one. So um, we try to get, reduce this factor. Yeah? One major issue that I'm seeing right now, the Ash experiment, uh, yeah. Um, to the participant, they felt like they were making their own decisions. But in the robots, like for me, if I would participate, I know pretty much that they're programmed. So how do you create this experiment that they are making, like measuring it and saying something, as opposed to just doing what you click? Yeah. Make them write some text. Pardon? Yeah. Make well, them write some text. Yes, that's first of make all them something. Seem, make it, them seem as if they are making independent decisions yeah. by not making them wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ash's, that's... Ash's confederates were always wrong. No, at the beginning they were right. At the beginning they were also right, and then they started, yes. And another thing, what you can do, or what, you are, what we are doing is, um, you know, many people know about Watson, and also the knowledge and the power robots now have. Um, and artificial intelligence, so they already are like aware of um, those things, those artificial AIs are really close to us. It's not like someone is just programming that's yes, no. They are really starting to get like intelligent. Um, so if you give them those information first, um, they create something, at least we predict or we think, that they, they create something like, ah, that's in kind of an individual. That's why I also give them, they also all wear different clothes. To give them more individuality, create a story behind them, why they are different. Um, because otherwise, yes, it could be just this one type of robot to all make the same mistake. So, yeah. And like, have you thought about maybe letting them face the screen as well? What do you mean, face the screen? They all sit, they sit all in the row. Yeah, exactly, and they're facing the participant. Or the oh. participant is looking at the screen. And I think it would be way more realistic if you around and say they're looking at the same screen as you and they're also analyzing it. I mean it only works if they believe that they're, but they're doing it. The computer vision tracking like but they're doing this they all sit like here here here, here. yeah we all yeah 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 so everyone sees the same and like then the first robot says the answer the second robot says the answer and you're sitting in the circle yeah we all look in this direction yes yeah I think it's time for cake if you, that's okay. Cool, thanks. <laughs>